This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 226, with Michael Losh and David Dutton. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Here is your host, Inside the Dojo, MC Laubscher. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobs here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today, and in today's show, we're going to look at how you can pay off your home and any mortgage in five to seven years on your current level of income. My guests in this interview are Michael Lush and David Dutton from Replace Your Mortgage. If you could pay off a mortgage in even a third of the time, instead of waiting 30 years to pay it off, wouldn't you want to know how to do that? It is possible with the right loan. While it may seem unbelievable, it comes really down to math and a little education that banks prefer homeowners and property owners not know about. Michael Lush has spent 15 years as a mortgage originator, helping consumers get into their dream homes. After speaking to a wealthy mentor of his, he then stumbled across how the wealthy finance their homes using lines of credit. Along with his colleague, David Dutton, Lush now teaches homeowners as well as successful real estate investors how to use a simple home equity line of credit to pay off a home in five to seven years. Michael and David share through their book, their YouTube channel, and courses why making extra payments on a mortgage versus a HELOC is still slower and also locks your money up until you sell your home. Important reasons why this strategy isn't more well-known, how to pay off a home faster, even if you have very little equity, powerful resources that will help you get started quickly to become mortgage-free, the pros and cons of a HELOC, deadly mistakes homeowners make when using a HELOC, how to build a real estate empire, and how to buy a vacation home and pay it off quickly. Please share your feedback and thoughts on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at cashflowninja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at cashflowninja.com or texting Cashflow Ninja to 44222. To ensure you never miss one of our episodes, you can download our free interactive smartphone apps on the Apple and Google Play app stores. I've also created a Cashflow Ninja investment group where I share opportunities that I'm investing in with my fellow investors. If you're interested in joining this group, please email me at info at cashflowninja.com and we will continue the conversation to see if you're a good fit for our group. I've always thought that if there's only a handful of people that have built indestructible wealth in any economy and any market, Why are we following the advice and doing what the majority of people are doing that are struggling financially? My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy, but you need to pick one. At The Real Asset Investor, Dave and his company create value for investors looking for higher yield returns from real estate ventures domestically and internationally. To learn more about this exciting investment opportunities the Real Asset Investor offers, such as the syndication opportunity at Mahogany Bay Village in Belize, investment opportunities in the multifamily space in the United States, and ATM syndication opportunities, please visit cashflowninja.com forward slash real asset investor. Have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Are you interested in real estate investing and don't know where to start or how to get the results you want? For valuable information to get you started, visit JoinOps Properties at JoinOpsProperties.com. The wealthiest investors on the planet know how to capture their wealth and leverage it to perpetually grow it. If you're interested in learning the premier strategies of the wealthiest individuals and families on the planet, you can access your free webinar at CashflowNinja.com forward slash be the bank. David and Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can you guys please share a little bit about your background and journey with my listeners? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, My name is Michael Lush. um, So just so you can put a a name with a voice. I started in 2001 right out of college uh, in the mortgage industry. I had a, a buddy of mine 
who had been working there. And um, I can't say the name of the company, but it was uh, ninth largest lender in the nation at the time. And uh, he said, look, I, you know, based on your skill set and your personality, I, I think you would make a lot of money doing this. And sure enough, you know, I joined within three months, uh, was doing pretty well, and it rose through the ranks pretty fast. And uh, on my birthday in 2007 uh, is when the company actually filed bankruptcy. So that, that towards the end of the meltdown there, or the beginning of the meltdown, I should say, um, it was kind of a subprime company. However, less than 1% of their portfolio was what we would call subprime products. Uh, they had a, a net tangible benefit test on all of their loans that they did. So it was um, – it was weird. It's kind of one of the more responsible subprime lenders out there, but I would still say that they were subprime and that money just dried up overnight. Um, I was at a branch in Charlotte, North Carolina where we were doing, you know, about 500 units a month. And it literally within 30 days, we dropped to 60 or 70 units. Uh, so we knew that the end was uh, writing was on the wall. So on my birthday is when they filed bankruptcy, laid everyone off. Um, my wife was working for them at the time. I was uh, one of the top, Senior managers at that company. My wife was top five um, loan officers with that company. So we both went from great income to no income literally overnight. Um, so, and actually, it was funny because if I could rewind a little bit, I had another buddy who left that company and went to a, another company and was trying to sell me on a first lien HELOC. Uh, that that's what I, sh- when I bought that house in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's what I should have bought it with was a first lien HELOC. And I didn't really understand what he was saying. And to be honest, I don't think he understood what he was trying to convey to me either. He was just regurgitating some information and just said, no, th- th- this is good and, and this is what you should do. But he couldn't really articulate it to, to get me un- to understand it. Um, so I actually did close on a mortgage and then a HELOC. And then shortly after I closed, I actually turned my HELOC into a mortgage. You know, to say you don't know what you don't know. And if I could go back in time, I probably wouldn't have had the financial pitfalls that I did. So that company filed bankruptcy and uh, led to just financial turmoil for, for myself. And not for the you know, purposes of it was the bank's uh, fault because they filed bankruptcy. So therefore, I didn't have an income. Heck, we were making great money up until then. We were just making horrible choices. You know, I was in my early 20s, obviously. And as fast as money c- came in, it was going out. I was buying cars, houses, motorcycles, four-wheelers. You name it, uh, trips to Vegas or D.C. or anywhere I wanted. And that was the reason why I personally had financial turmoil because I wasn't responsible with it. And after uh, 2008, uh, that company called me and said, hey, we're going to resurrect again. Uh, This time, obviously, we got to do government loans, uh, FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie, Freddie, et cetera. Um, And we want you to head up our Nashville operations. So I'd already moved back to Nashville, which is my hometown from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, they called me and said, look, we want you to head that up. So I did. And within a couple of years, um, that branch was uh, the most profitable, most successful branch. Um, I would say in part due to me, but mostly because I was good at delegating and and outsourcing to people who are uh, strong where I was weak. And at the person who was close to that branch uh, actually owned a hedge fund and that hedge fund owned the company that I worked for, the mortgage company that I worked for. And he was in town and uh, he would check in every now and then to see how things were going. And uh, I told him, I said, John, you know, you, you've got wealthy friends uh, and family and you obviously know what I do. You own the company, uh, so to speak, indirectly. Um, so if I could, you know, somehow network with your uh, sphere of influence, that would be great. You know, I could get those mortgages and we both know big mortgages mean big commissions and and big revenues for the company. So, you know, if you could introduce me, that would be great. And he said, look, I think you're great at what you do, but no one along my circle of influence really does mortgages. And that's when he hit me with it. He said, what we do is first lien position, home equity lines of credit. And I didn't understand that. I I remember back in the day when a buddy of mine was trying to get me to do it and I didn't do it. And. So obviously this intrigued me and he said, look, I've got 10 minutes. I'll explain it to you. So he explained it to me, high level version in about 10 minutes. And for a year and a half, that was in 2009, for about a year and a half after that, I just went on a journey really to try to disprove it. Because if what he was saying was true, then what I was doing was wrong. And I didn't want to be wrong. So I was trying to figure out every little angle to make mortgages make more sense. And for some folks, it does, not mathematically, just because of their behavior. But I couldn't make it make sense mathematically. 
so that's when me and my wife decided, um, as we were rising through the ashes of our financial turmoil, you know, we got back on our feet, had a, a nest egg, and we decided, that, look, we're, we're going to buy this house and we're going to put it on a home equity line of credit and a first lien one. And that's what we did. And along my journey, I realized that hardly anybody knew this, especially bankers. You know, that folks who learn it from us then assume that the bankers know this. They just hide it from, from us because they know that they're not going to make as much money, you know, earning interest on, on those dollars that they would on the mortgage. And that's, that's not the case. You know, a lot of banks, nine out of 10 banks that I would call to get my house on the first thing he locked had no clue what I was talking about. However, 100% of them, after getting to the right person uh, with that institution, did allow a first lien position HELOC. Uh, all banks did. And that's what David and I teach folks is that every bank allows a first lien position HELOC. It's just they're very different from bank to bank and institution to institution. So they're not hiding it from you. They just don't know what they don't know. Um, so if you're trying to get your advice from a banker uh, or a loan officer, you're just you're going down the wrong direction, the wrong path. So anyways, got that house on the first lien position HELOC started doing it like a checking account and started implementing different strategies. So I was literally learning as I was going, learning some inefficiencies that I was doing, um, not offset accounting and things of that nature. So, you know, I didn't quite have the mentor that, that we've created this course now that mentors other folks. So I made some mistakes and to the tune of about $18,000 is what it cost me. Now, when I say it cost me 18,000, I was still far ahead of what I would have been on a mortgage. But had I been practicing it the proper way the whole time, I would have saved myself another $18,000 of interest. But anyways, got that house paid off. And, you know, the, the rest is history. Just decided to start teaching folks this. So I was still in the mortgage industry, even though I personally didn't have a mortgage. And that didn't sit right with me. It's like, well, look, if, if I'm telling folks or me personally not having a mortgage and wouldn't have a mortgage and have it since then, why would I, why am I still selling mortgages to other folks? So, I started adopting a strategy, which is a first mortgage and a second uh, HELOC combo. One, it allowed me to outprice my competition in the mortgage industry, but I was also giving them the education of how to chunk using your second lien HELOC onto your first mortgage and, and get it paid off faster. So it, it separated me from my competition as well. I, I wasn't white noise. I was different than all the other mortgage lenders that were calling. So I was able to, to build up quite the book of business by teaching it that way. And then finally, you know, I had another mentor, Jimmy, down in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and said, look, this is something you need to do. This is what you're passionate about. This is what you need to do. You need to turn it into a business, and that's all you need to do. And, um, and several years ago, that's what I, I did. I built a course and I did market it online like David has, has done with our business, but, you know, was somewhat online and, and doing live seminars. And I would also do live webinars where I invite people to my webinar and and uh, David and I uh, partnered up probably six or eight months after that. And that was just adding gas to the, the fire. And, and it's exploded since then. So now we've, we've literally taught uh, tens of thousands of folks how to do this. David, uh, share a little bit about your background yeah. uh, with uh, my listeners. Absolutely. So, um, so I live uh, right outside. Michael and I live up the road. He moved a little bit farther out. But uh, I'm, in, I'm from around Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I, for the past, as long as Michael has been doing mortgages uh, in that industry, I've been doing making money online, selling information products. I've written seven books. Uh, started when I was in college. I was poor. I eat ramen noodles, peanut butter ramen noodles by choice. Uh, I say that because uh, I could have got gotten a professional $50,000 a year sales job. But for me, that was settling and had already tasted you know, being an entrepreneur and that type of thing. And so I was, I feel like that's just, it's who I am. And so I just kind of stuck it out whenever all my friends had real jobs and they were making more money than me. Um, at the time I looked like I was going nowhere, but I had already started making money online and just, I stuck with it, started writing books and I've owned several websites. Um, and then, um, I'll just kind of fast forward because I want to get into the meat of the stuff. I'll just tell you a little bit about our story, but um, probably I'm probably five years ago, a buddy of mine in Knoxville named Jonathan um, Taylor told me about him signing up for something that, um, and he could pay us home off early. And I didn't have no clue. I had no clue about it. Obviously no mortgage experience, never thought about being in the mortgage business or anything. 
And um, we would get together once or twice a month when he'd come to Nashville to see some clients. And I'd always ask him about it because I was waiting for like the scam. And, you know, his mortgage payment was lower and, and I just, I didn't understand it at all, but I didn't even know what type of loan or anything like that. But long story short, he ended up paying his home off. Well, it, I was very skeptical and it took me, I didn't implement it till a couple more years later. I was about to start to implement. And then, um, I ended up getting in the mortgage business, um, because, uh, I feel like a lot of mortgage people are not marketers and I feel like I can market and just have people do the mortgages for me. Um, I feel like I can generate the leads and, and all that stuff. And so a buddy of mine, a really good friend named Tim got me in the mortgage business. I got my license and, um, that's what I was going to do. Uh, but my wife and I were about to get a HELOC and Michael, uh, had saw one of my books I wrote is how to buy your dream home if you're self-employed. And, uh, Michael saw me written up in the paper here locally, reached out and, uh, wanted to know more. We, long story short, we ended up meeting and, uh, he ended up talking about what he was doing. And I said, you know, he asked, could we compare notes? And I was like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's cool because hardly anybody knows about this. And it was kind of cool to actually talk to somebody, um, about that. So we met and I thought, you know, he's got a great message and, you know, he's actually, you know, a legit expert at it. Uh, but you know, he's not a marketer. And, and so I thought, you know, like I could just do what I do, what I've been doing for 17 years and I know it can increase it. So we started out just as a, you know, kind of as Michael would call it, as an affiliate or whatever. And it just blew up and, um, it's been a great, just a great fit. I mean, he's great at what he does and, um, and, uh, we've built a great company and, and I, I continue to mostly do the marketing and he does the education and works with the banks. And, you know, we have, you know, over a thousand clients and, um, they've actually, you know, reached out and, you know, wanted personal help from us, which is exciting. And like Michael said, we've helped tens of thousands of people, um, through the process. And so it's, it's been a, it's been a great ride. And we, and we paid off our house. Uh, my wife and I paid off our house a couple months ago. Um, now, um, which is exciting cause we're not 40 yet. And uh, now, but we end up leveraging it again, um, to buy an investment property, which we just paid cash for. And so one of the things we don't really talk about much cause we don't want to overwhelm people is building wealth after you pay off your home or not necessarily after you could do it during the process too, but is building wealth with it and not, you know, buying uh, liabilities, but buying assets. So that's a story in a nutshell. It's been a good ride. Yeah, I like that. And I like uh, how you guys complement each other really nicely uh, within your business with uh, different skill sets. This strategy is, uh, is extremely interesting and intriguing. And, you know, Michael touched on something as well that, you know, you you don't know what you don't know, and I I believe it was Will Rogers that had a quote too that said uh, uh, something to to the effect with the problem with people isn't what they don't know is what they think they know that just ain't so, <laughs> and I would say that this definitely falls into that category where there's a lot of mis uh, misunderstanding or misconception or uh, about this. Um, can you share the strategy uh, to my listeners of how uh, what you teach of uh, how to pay off mortgages in five to seven years? Yeah, absolutely. First, we need to go back and understand the history of mortgages, at least in the United States. You know, I can't speak for everywhere in the world, but in the United States prior to 1913, what was a mortgage, what we called a mortgage was, if you looked at the components of it, it was very similar to a home equity line of credit. So money could move in and out freely. And Americans were literally using their home as an operating account. So if you had equity, you could literally go to the bank that day and get money from equity that day. Um, you know, back in the good old days when it was a handshake deal. So, you know, we hear the rumors of our grandparents, great grandparents who bought a house, put 10, 20 percent down, paid it off in five to seven years. And there was two reasons for it. One, they were, in my opinion, just a better generation. They didn't have TV, internet, things of that nature. Uh, they read books. They educated themselves uh, just more efficient with their time. So I think they were a better generation. But two, they also had a, an unfair advantage that, that we don't think we have today. 
And that was a mortgage was very different back then than it is today. So what happened in 1913? 1913 was when the Federal Reserve was instituted here in the United States. And the Federal Reserve gives banks to uh, the capability of initiating what's called fractional reserve lending. Fractional reserve lending is for every dollar you put in a check or savings account, that bank really has to $15 to lend out. So think about that. That's a pretty cool magic trick. If you hand me a dollar and I snap my fingers and it's $10, what do you think my next question out of you is going to be? MC? It's going to be, can I get another dollar? Or can you give me a $10 bill this time or a $100 bill? Because if I snap my fingers and tenfold, uh, I have that. That's a very cool and profitable magic trick. So the banks got hold of this and said, hold up. If that's the case, then what we really need is core deposits. We need more checking and savings accounts. So how are we going to build our core deposits? And they looked at how the average American was parking their money and they were parking it in their mortgage or their, uh, their real estate. So they made a simple change. And again, prior to this, mortgages money can move in and out freely. They all got together and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a mortgage and installment loan. It's a closed in product. So money can only move in and not come out. So think about that. If money can only go in and not come out, are you now going to use your home as a checking account? Are you going to put 100% of your income into it? No, of course not. Because when it's time to pay your bills, it's stuck in the bank's treasure chest. You have no access to your equity. So now you're only going to put some of your money in there, and you have to leave money behind to pay those bills. So if you only put some of your money in there, obviously it's going to take longer to pay off, which means more interest, more profits for the bank. But that wasn't the number one reason that they did it. That was a byproduct. Number one reason was, what did it force you to do? It forced you to segregate your income. So that money you left behind to pay those other bills and expenses, where do you think you left it? In the welcoming hands of the banks for their checking and savings accounts. And that's how they grew core deposits. So, you know, as I talk to banks um, today, um, you know, Dave and I consult with banks and obviously, you know, we, we've researched hundreds of different banks uh, based on their, their HELOCs. And I can tell you, their number one focus, regardless of what bank it is, credit unit it is, their number one fo- focus is to grow core deposits because of fractional reserve lending purposes. So a mortgage was never created the, the way that we think of mortgages today. It was never created to be consumer friendly. In fact, it's the, the antithesis of it. It was created to segregate income. And if you even go back to what the mortgage means, what the, the root word is, it's old French for death pledge, mort engage. Uh, so it's two separate words that we put together as mortgage in the English uh, dictionary. And it's, it's actually the root of it means death pledge. So, you know, I think it's important for under, folks to understand how mortgage was, was created and what, what it's come to, to, to this day being a, a 86% of Americans have a 30 year mortgage. Um, and most of them never get it paid off. They refinance backwards to a lower rate or a lower payment and just restart the amortization schedule all over again. So what we teach is to refinance. If they already have a mortgage, they already own the house, to refinance into a first lien position home equity line of credit. That right there confuses people, but it's it's important that we specify first lien position home equity line of credit. So what that means is you're turning your mortgage into a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, just a simple refinance. Although that sounds very simple, that confuses the heck out of a lot of bankers. Because they're like they're just like a consumer with a suit on, thinking, "Well, I can only use the equity that I've built up in my home above and beyond what the balance is on my mortgage and the value of my home. That's the portion I can use for a HELOC. So if I only have ten percent equity, how am I going to pay off ninety percent of my mortgage? What well, it's a refinance. So you're not really getting a second lien HELOC and using those funds to pay off the mortgage. You're doing it at the closing table. Think of it this way." If you had an FHA loan and you want to refinance to a conventional loan to get rid of your MI or, you know, lower your payments or your rate or or even the term, are they using the equity above and beyond the balance of the mortgage and the value of the house? No. All they're doing is refinancing. They are replacing that existing mortgage. Hence the, the name of our company, Replace Your Mortgage. So that's the first step is just refinancing into a HELOC. Now, if you're buying a home, a lot of folks don't realize this. They think, well, I've got to start off in a mortgage, build equity, then I can use a HELOC. Nope, that's not the case at all. There's actually quite a few banks that allow you to purchase a property, rental as well, vacation homes, primary residence. You can buy a home using a home equity line of credit. So key number one, start with a first position home equity line of credit. 
Now, there's some other philosophies out there of using a mortgage, a fixed rate mortgage, and then a second lien HELOC and use that to chunk down. You can absolutely do that. But one, it's less efficient. It's about 20% less efficient than a first lien HELOC. Look, if we know that a mortgage is the enemy, then why have one at all? Why not just replace the entire thing with a first lien position home equity line of credit? So it's a little bit faster using a first lien position home equity line of credit. Also, it's less risk to the consumer and the bank. Because think about it from a bank standpoint. You know, if things were to hit the fan, you know, we go into a recession or depression or even a, a real estate bust, which is predicted in, in the you know, few short years coming, you know, do you think that bank wants to get paid first or last? Well, they want to get paid first. So folks that were doing this back in 08 and 09, depending on the markets, potentially had their HELOCs frozen. That's another objection that we get as well. I don't want to you know, have a HELOC and then the bank freezes it. Well, were you in first or second lien? Well, second lien. And again, we talked to banks. David and I talked to banks uh, about this. And I, I very frequently ask this question. If you had a customer in second lien position and we have a downturn, are you going to freeze it? Don't know. Depends on the market. But that, that option is there. And there's a high probability we would if values decrease. And especially if that, that consumer stops making payments, we're going to freeze that line of credit. Then I ask the question, what about the first lien position? Well, no, no, I mean, we don't need to because now the collateral is the house. We actually have full collateral of that house where if we had someone in front of us that was a mortgage holder, well, they get the, their money first and we get the crumbs that are left over. So a first lien protects the bank and therefore protects the consumer as well. And not a hundred percent, which, you know, folks are, you know, think, well, there's a potential of a freeze. There is on a mortgage as well. A mortgage has a document called the mortgage acceleration disclosure. And if you read that, it's kind of scary. Uh, the, there are nine to 11 different reasons that that mortgage holder can accelerate your loan due within 60 days for almost any reason. And I've witnessed it, not me personally, but I had a customer uh, through one of the banks that I worked for in the past that they accelerated his loan. He did nothing wrong. They just couldn't get it off their books and sell it to FHA. So they were offering him a refinance so they get a new case number and get it off their books. The consumer didn't want to refinance, even though it was attractive for him to do so. Um, he was just um, hard headed and, and didn't didn't want to do it and didn't want to go through the trouble, which is fine. That's it. That's his prerogative. So the bank said, that's fine. If you're not willing to refinance, we're going to force you to pay us off within 60 days and execute the mortgage acceleration clause. We did nothing wrong. So folks have this false sense of security with a mortgage that that can't happen with a mortgage. I, I personally witnessed it. Yes, you can. In fact, you sign a document. Everyone who has a mortgage signs a document at closing, allowing that mortgage lender to do just that in case they need to. So being in first lien protects you to, to a certain degree, no, not everyone. So you get in first lien position. And the other thing is where we don't want to segregate money. This isn't a payment strategy. You don't want to say, well, my HELOC payment is now only 600 bucks. So I'm going to pay 1200. That's not what you do. A HELOC is a open end, simple interest line of credit. So money can move in and out freely 24 seven. In fact, a lot of these banks are going to give you debit cards, checks, et cetera. So you have the frequent access to your HELOC as many times as you want throughout the month. So, why are we putting our money into a checking and savings account? I call it a liability. I know it may not be the technical definition of it, but I call it a liability because look, if I put my money in a checking and savings account, what are they going to give me as a rate of return? The national average is 0.17%. Well, inflation is far, far higher than that. You know, one and a half to 3.3%. If you look at a 200 year average, 3.3% inflation rate year over year. So why am I going to put my money in park it somewhere? At, let's just call it 0%, and I lose 3% because it's not keeping up with inflation. You know, a mentor of mine, Jim, uh, had told me, look, if I give you $300,000 and you put it in a tin can and bury it in your backyard, 30 years from now, what is the value of that tin can? And a lot of folks would say, well, $300,000 because you put $300,000 of cash in it. The answer is no, it's not worth $300,000 because inflation, the cost of goods and services are increasing. So 30 years from now, that's going to be the equivalent of about $120,000 of value because the cost of goods and services have increased. So I'm not going to park my money in a check and savings account. I'm going to park it in my HELOC because a HELOC also does something differently than a mortgage. It recasts freely every single day. So if I put my cash in there and my balance drops, well, the next day I'm paying interest on the lower balance, not the original balance, not an amortization schedule. So now more money, every time money flows in there, it's more efficient because it's paying more of the principal and less of the interest. 
Um, so that's that's a key step is forgetting that you have a check in our savings account. Deposit your money into a home equity line of credit on top of other techniques uh, and advanced strategies that we teach. That is going to get you much further down the road than you would have uh, with a mortgage. To answer your question, MC. Yeah, it does. I've got a couple. So the the, the first lien position. How are banks? Uh, how do they? How do they feel taking that second lien position on a on a property? Yeah, they allow it. Every so far, I haven't come across a single bank that does not allow second or first lien position. Because think about it. But let's say I needed to borrow money from you, and you said, "Yeah, no problem. I'll give you five hundred bucks." But then I say, "Well, hold up. Here's the caveat. I already owe John five hundred bucks." So when I come into money, John gets paid first before you, or let's even use it's collateral. Let's say I need to put up collateral, a car, right? So let's say I stop paying you or John who are borrowed, but John is who I borrowed money from first. So John has collateral rights to that car. And then if we sell the car, if there's any additional value left over after John's paid his money back, then you get the rest. So you may or may not get paid back. So what do you think a bank wants? Do you think they want to be paid first or last? They want to be in first lien position. That way they're guaranteed collateral rights to that house. So every bank, if you talk to the appropriate person, will allow first lien position. And we've investigated well over 500 banks and credit unions across this country. So far, we haven't come across a single one that won't. It just makes sense for them. It's, it's common sense for them. But having that banker know that, that's a difficult task because they will say, no, no, never heard of it. Can't be done. We hear it all the time, every single day. However, once we get it escalated to an executive or an underwriter, et cetera, we finally get the truth. And they're like, yeah, of course we'll do that. So first lien position is actually easy to come by if you know the right questions to ask. You're listening to Michael Lush and David Dutton on the Cashflow Ninja Podcast. We will be right back after a word from our sponsor. This is MC Laubscher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja Podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Alhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining the capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you're interested to learn more about privatized banking and the infinite banking concept, you can access an exclusive webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. You're listening to Michael Lush and David Dutton on the Cashflow Ninja podcast and now back to our interview. And the second question that I would have um, also is on the cash flow management. Now you've set up the HELOC uh, on, the, on the home uh, and you're paying the money in there rather than basically into a checking, as you've mentioned, and you've touched on a couple of problems. Uh, and I've spoken even about the Dodd-Frank bill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on this podcast, uh, that changed basically the nature and the relationship oh, of yeah. banking as well. Um, mm -hmm. So in a, in a possible next crisis, the bank can actually access the depositors' funds to recapitalize the banks, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. So we've touched upon that. Cash flow management, uh, now we, we're, we're paying money into the HELOC instead of the, the checking or sa savings account. Um, can you share a couple of strategies to th then basically how you eliminate this mortgage uh, that you have in place on the home? Yeah, number one, this is for somebody who's post budget. Okay, so if somebody were to come to us and contact us, and this happens on a on a uh, consistent basis, where seventy percent of the clients or potential clients that contact us, we don't allow them to become clients because they are not post budget clients. And what I mean by that is. They first have to get a handle on their finances. Uh, so they have to be bringing in more money than they spend. They need to know exactly what's coming in. And a lot of folks do know exactly how much they bring in. But a lot of folks and most folks don't know how much is going out. So we have them do a three-year analysis. And the reason why I pick three years is if you did a three-month analysis and you're looking at your bank statements of what you're spending, there's a lot of things that won't come up. Like, for instance, me. I'm not a car guy. Um, I don't mind riding in fancy cars or, or looking at, at other people who have fancy cars. I, I, I like looking at those, but I don't like owning fancy cars. So I own uh, three cars right now. One is a Lexus, 
GS 300. It's got 385,000 miles on it. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, runs just fine. I have a 2006 Jeep uh, Commander. Now, I literally just got the news over the weekend. My mechanic had called me and said, the Jeep's done. You know, it, if you put money into it, you're probably going to be bringing it back every other month for me to fix. So not worth it. It's not worth anything. I rode it until the wheels fell off, literally. So time for me to move on and get a new car. And that pains me. I hate spending money on cars. Um, so, but I'm going to because, you know, we, we have to have transportation. So folks that come to us that we allow to become clients already have a handle on their budget. You know, they're not somebody who brings in 10 grand and spends 11, which we see so often today, which, you know, kind of to your point, how there's a, another crisis coming about. Man, we see the writing on the wall because so many people, potential clients of ours come to us and they, they need to go to Dave Ramsey first. They need to get a handle on their budget before they talk to us. So we are more post budget folks. So they understand that, hey, I've got 10 grand coming in. And I only spend four or five grand going out. Now, there is no magical number. You know, obviously, the, the more cash flow positive you are, the faster this is going to be. But really managing this after you already understand your budget is pretty doggone simple. You know, it's instead of having multiple accounts, instead of having a checking account, a savings account, and a mortgage, you know, in Australia, they call this a money merge account. Why? Because it's merging several products into one. Now, your mortgage or your home or your HELOC not only is your home, but it's also your checking and savings account. So all you're doing is just using it like a checking and savings account. If you already have those disciplines, you're going to be successful. What David and I do is we have some other secret sauces that's inside of our course for our paying members that teach folks how to speed that up another 20 to 30% faster. That's what we get paid to do on top of showing them how to read leverage to build wealth. That's what we get paid to do. We don't get paid to tell folks, go get a first lien position on equity line of credit and use it as a checking account. And first and foremost, be on the budget. We give that away freely on our YouTube channel. We have 60 or 70 videos on our YouTube channel that we, we give that information away freely. Anybody can do that on their own. It's the secret sauce that we get paid to do. Now, you guys have you've touched on who this is not for. In every strategy, there's a couple of pitfalls to look out for, uh, or there might be some reasons or points that something might not work. I have personal experience about uh, on this because I've shared, for instance, uh, how to use high cash value life insurance in certain strategies to put a cash flow management structure together for investing, mm -hmm. also known as infinite banking. So some Huge folks, fan of that. yeah, so some folks hear about the strategy and then they just go out to a, a regular insurance professional, mm -hmm. try to get mm -hmm. it set up. It's not set up with the right company. It's net, not set up a, a, according to the strategy, the person doesn't know how to do that. And then I hear the feedback back, well, this doesn't work. This is a scam, you know, and, and so <laughs> forth. So I'm sure this is something like this happens with you guys as well. So mm -hmm. let's touch on some reasons why this wouldn't work and what pitfalls to look out for. One is you're not cash flow positive. So you don't have it on your budget. You can't put, and I'm just using 10 grand as a big round number, but you can't put 10 grand into the HELOC and then pull 9,800 out or even 10 grand. The slogan is it's math, not magic. So it's not the magical elixir of fixing your problems if you don't understand the root of your problem, which is first and foremost budget. Also, you have to resist temptation because if you are cash flow positive and you do have a handle on your budget, using the strategy you are going to melt your balance down quickly. Um, one of our clients, uh, the fastest was 11 months. Uh, actually, uh, we have another guy who not only paid his house off, but paid cash for a vacation on the 13 months. It happens very, very fast. Not for everyone. The, those folks were massively cash flow positive, obviously. The average American is not going to have the type of income that those two individuals did, but our average is five to seven years. But even in five to seven years, that principle is dropping quickly. Actually, on average, it's thirty thousand a year. So you're going to have access to the amount of amount of cash that you haven't. The typical American doesn't have access to on a, on a regular basis. So you have to resist temptation. And what I mean by that is, you know, folks think that it's difficult to perform. It's not once you understand the ins and outs and how to, to one get the proper one with your situation and also how to execute it on a proper plan given your situation. Uh, you can automate it so that you don't have to do any more thinking or any manual pushing over. Everything can be automated for you and money's going to, or the, the principle is going to drop dramatically. And you're looking at 
you know, this cash and you're like, wow, I've got fifty, sixty thousand dollars cash. Well, I've always wanted this, uh, you know, Ford Raptor, uh, seventy thousand dollars truck. So now I can go pay cash for it. That's the type of temptation you have to resist is tapping into that equity to buy liabilities and not assets. Now we're all about leveraging, you know, what you on uh, IBC or infinite bank assets, huge fans of those. Uh, we actually have that in our course. We have uh, two professionals who are very specific to IBC. One of us has been doing it for a couple decades. Uh, so, yeah, it's part of, of our program of building that wealth of how, it, you know, a HELOC and IBC is a perfect marriage for one another. So we teach how to use both of them in conjunction with another. You're building wealth, but also paying down your house at the same time. The idea of eventually being your own bank. Uh, heck, my first domain w- with this business was evictedbanks.com. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, ironically, we use a bank product to get there. <laughs> so you can't, you can't uh, immediately evict them. You, you've got to use the tools and assets that they're, they're willingly providing and have been for decades. We talk about, too, of how to leverage yourself and your, your assets that, that you have and then mm-hmm. – Combine that with leveraging other assets and vehicles, uh, like you mentioned, with the bank. And again, it all comes down, folks, to uh, strategies, right? There are strategies for everything because I think one of the things in, in our society, it, we're so focused on products, right? Shiny objects, and it's all products. You know, it, it, we all have the same asset classes to invest in. There's the same the same uh, vehicles are available for everyone out there. It's the, the rich dad philosophy of, what strategies are you using incorporating these products into systems and processes within your wealth plan? You know, if mm-hmm. somebody just comes to you and talks about a HELOC, <laughs> you know, everybody's got, where does it fit in? What's the strategy that you're using it right. for? The same with life insurance. How, what's the, what's the systems and processes that it, that it, that's a part of and how does it particularly fit into your wealth plan? or your strategy. So I think it's very important to understand that these are simply vehicles that is part of a comprehensive strategy and plan. Absolutely. Uh, now, uh, guys, uh, one habit I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. Uh, what are you guys studying right now? And what skill sets are you guys learning? So anybody that knows me, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker, Kool-Aid drinking entrepreneur. Um, I've, I've been self-employed since I was 20 years old and haven't looked back. Um, um, and it's hard to beat uh, an ROI um, in as far as a business goes. And and I would say even more specifically in marketing. Um, you know, we you know I've, we've had campaigns uh, in the past where we spent 500 and made. $22,000 or whatever, you know, and, and so I'm always sharpening my ax as far as becoming a better marketer. Um, and just, you know, looking at businesses to invest in, but also I like to diversify. Uh, so for me and my family right now, um, we are looking at getting into a uh, turnkey real estate investing with Clayton Morris, Morris invest. Um, this is, you know, there's lots of, there's a million ways to make money in real estate, but, I don't have lots of time as Michael and I are running this company. And so, um, so we're doing some turnkey real estate investing. We're working on replacing my wife's income with, um, with turnkey properties. And eventually I would like to get into commercial, uh, investing. So I'm kind of learning, um, about that type of stuff as well. And of course we, we bought a, another investment property last week, uh, in our neighborhood. And so, um, I'm just trying to sharpen my skills as far as um, becoming a real estate investor to kind of diversify and have more passive income um, outside of business. So that's where that's where my brain's at now. I recently just became intrigued in commercial uh, properties. Um, now I was in Denver for a couple of days last week uh, attending a conference, and there was some economists and forecasters there. So. Getting it, I'll be honest with you, getting into real estate right now uh, makes me nervous. And I get it. It's a long-term play. It's not something in short term. Uh, but, you know, some of those economists uh, had a, a gloom and doom picture of the real estate market. But, you know, recently Dave and I had met someone who um, is a hack when it comes to commercial real estate investing. And I've got another gentleman that I talk to on a, on a pretty consistent basis uh, here in town who he's not into the single-family uh, residential properties. 
Um, he would like to, if he's going to leverage his money, uh, he would like to get multiple units, four, six, eight units, kind of like the Grant Cardone theory. You know, don't buy a house unless you've uh, owned a 12 unit apartment complex, which I don't agree with. But, um, you know, obviously, if you can, you know, w- one gentleman had said it's easier to get a million dollar loan than it is a hundred thousand dollar loan when you're trying to invest, uh, which I find interesting. So, Dave and I recently met with someone who has some really good content that we're going to, um, in the near future have in our program as well. And it's, it's commercial real estate investing. So that's kind of got my, uh, my attention peaked and kind of makes the hair on my arm stand up. However, um, right now I'm, I'm very conservative. You know, you're talking to a guy that, that, you know, this information is freely in my book. We lost everything in 2008. Um, I don't want to go through that again. You know, I've got three little kids. I got a wife. I want to take care of them. I want to make sure that they're set up for life. So I tend to be conservative and not much of a, a risk taker. However, some folks would say, well, you're an entrepreneur as well. I mean, that, that takes a lot of risk and jumping off a cliff. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I would say the long winded version of, of this answer is I'm into commercial right now. I'm just trying to learn that, not actually investing in it yet, but uh, in IBC you know, is something that. Uh, I think I'm going to get licensed in the next month or two. I don't want to just be a consumer of it. I, I truly want to understand it. And that's why we have some gentlemen in our program who teach that because I'm not licensed to do so. I understand HELOCs, I understand mortgages, and I'll, I'll teach you all that you want to know about that. But anything that's outside of my wheelhouse, we're outsourcing to those professionals that are doing it much longer. Now, guys, a, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? I'll go first. And I don't know that I've prepared three, but this is something that has been on my mind for uh, a year more, ever since I've had kids. So I've got a six year old, a four year old, and and now a a one and a half year old. And I went to college, but, you know, actually, I think David and I were talking about this last week as well with the commercial guy. I, college is not for everybody. And everybody thinks that that's the milestone that you have to achieve. If you want to be successful in life, you need to go to college. Um, I, I don't think it's for everybody. I think if you have a specific skill set that you want to learn, you know, doctor, lawyer, et cetera, CPA, pharmacist, yeah, go, go to school, go to college. Um, however, if you're an entrepreneur and you really want to run businesses, then I don't necessarily think that college is the best thing for you. I just think it's the most expensive B&I group out there. Um, you know, you can get just as much of an education on YouTube uh, or, or Google for that matter. I mean, these are we're in an in a age now where information is so free and so available instantly. You know, we used to watch those shows. Uh, I think it was actually Matrix where, you know, Keanu Reeves wanted to learn Taekwondo. Uh, so he, plugged into the matrix and within a split second, he knows Taekwondo. Uh, Obviously it's not that fast, but my goodness, we live in an age where you can learn almost anything you want uh, through the internet. So if you're an entrepreneur, that's the cheapest form of education and actually getting in the trenches and doing it. Um, Going to school uh, and having a college degree and having a hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt only to graduate trying to get that job that no longer exists for the specialty that you learned makes no sense to me. So don't necessarily have three, but you know, if, if you, you know, that generation is coming up or even your kids, I'm not pushing my kids to go to college. If they want to go to college, that's fine. I'm going to plan for it. But if, if they want to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to let them know that they don't necessarily have to go to college to learn from a professor who's never been an entrepreneur on how to be an entrepreneur. It's a skills economy right now. It's no longer a jobs economy. Mm-hmm. It's, com- it's completely changed. So to your point uh, that if you're going to go to go college, uh, you have to be very strategic in what you want to get out of it and what you want to learn there. And uh, if it is something that makes sense uh, in, in your plan, I mean, if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, there are cer- still certain professions, but just from a, from a, a skill-based economy needs analysis, you might be going there into an institution and a system that's still designed to pop out people looking for jobs, which no longer exist by the time that they pop out of those institutions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, David, how about yourself? Cool. Um, man, that's, this is such a great topic. I, I even like listening to it, um, listening to you guys talk about it. But, um, you know, yeah, Michael and I did talk about this last 
week. Um, you know, one of my, f- I told, I told Michael this last night or last week that I think the skill of selling is the greatest skill besides say someone like a doctor that's actually, uh, or a nurse or something, you know, a health professional that's saving someone's life, you know, but behind that, I think selling is the greatest skill. Um, and, and so I know at least for, for me, I'm teaching my daughter, you know, she's six, you know, and I'm teaching her that simply because she can, even if she's never an entrepreneur, she can always sell herself into the job that she wants or, or sell her boss on a high, while she's worth more, uh, you know, to get a raise or whatever. And so I think selling, um, is the greatest, uh, skill. Um, so one, I would say learn to sell and change your perception. If you struggle with the whole used car salesman or insurance salesman or, all that mentality, just look at it as like, if you had the cure for cancer, you should do everything ethically and morally to sell people that you have the cure for cancer. Just because you have the cure for cancer doesn't make, you know, doesn't help people. And people actually have to know about it. You have to sell them on that uh, concept or whatever. So, um, so I'd say selling, uh, to, um, I'm always a big advocate, uh, my platform of being self-employed. There's so many benefits to being self-employed, including you know, taxes and freedom. Um, so um, even if it's a part-time, I always talk about even starting a part-time business, making a thousand to 5,000 a month or whatever in a small business, there's so many benefits that a W2 employee doesn't have. Uh, so I would say, look at starting some sort of business and, um, you know, get access to, you know, other benefits, you know, like, you know, writing off your home as a home office, writing off vacations, um, that type of thing, uh, is just examples. There's a million examples I could go into. Um, three, I would say, I'm, I'm actually going to say, I'm going to say four, so I'm going to break it. Uh, MC, uh, apologize about that, but I'm gonna give you a four. Uh, One, I was 22 when I saw this quote, I didn't know it was Jim Rohn at the time. But because the guy didn't give credit, but I saw it on this guy's website. Never forget it. Um, it said public education will make you live and self-education will make you rich. I was 22 in Bible college and wrestling with what I was going to do. Um, and it was right before I started making money on the Internet. And um, that I mean, that quote changed my life. You know, I mean, I was already in the going in the direction of being an entrepreneur, but you know, it's like I'm looking at a book right now, Built to Sell. Uh, you know, this book is probably, I probably paid $15 on Amazon and, you know, one or two tips. I mean, actually just one tip I got out of there will change if Michael and I were to ever sell this business, will change how we're selling the business. And I paid $15 for that. You know, not in a class or anything, but a book, you know. And so public education will make you live and self-education will make you rich. Um, and then the last thing I would share and this is really important is really know your priorities. Um, for me, I'm a freak about my time. Um, I read a book, um, guerrilla marketing when I was, uh, it was the first marketing book I ever bought. I was 20 years old and Jay Conrad Levinson, who's a, uh, you know, he's passed away now, but you know, famous, famous book, guerrilla marketing, uh, in the whole series, he mentioned something about working Monday through Thursday. And obviously he was super successful and, and all that. I mean, he was, you know, he's a thought leader in the industry or whatever. And that just really resonated with me. And I said, I'm going to do that. I want to be able to um, take my wife if we want to go to uh, get a cabin for the weekend, just pick up and go. And this is way before Tim Ferriss was even thinking about four hour work week. This is many, many years ago. And you know, I've time is super important to me because I can't ever get it back. And so I set up my schedule where I work my tail off Monday through Thursday and I kind of piddle on Friday because time is the most important um, thing we have. So, you know, I'll go eat lunch at 1030, which is crazy. 1030 in the morning with, with my kindergartner, uh, which is, I think is so early, but that's where they have lunch. And I'll just walk, you know, uh, there, the school is in the neighborhood. I'll just walk to my, uh, daughter's school and have lunch with her. And while everybody else is working during the day and Mike could get away a couple times a year, I can go anytime I want. And, um, I, I just think like having the priority of like, say family 
and re- realizing that I'm all about seasons of life of working really hard and a lot at certain times, whatever. I used to work a lot, a ton of hours in my twenties. And, uh, but then you, you know, then my, now my wife, my girlfriend at the time came along and I was like, man, really like hanging out with her. And, uh, so I started hanging out with her and we got married and, and all that. And so just when everybody else, when the masses, when the herd are doing certain things, look at the opposite of that. So when everybody's a workaholic, try to do the opposite of that. When everybody's keeping up with the Joneses, do the opposite of that. You know, um, when everybody's in debt, do the opposite of that. You know, and so that's the biggest thing that I would leave as well. Just even though everybody is doing certain things, that doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it the most efficient. Most people are broke. Most people are fat. Most people are unhappy with their job, that type of thing. So, Can I piggyback on that real quick? Because, David, you reminded me of something that I just started doing a couple of years ago because actually you, you had uh, told me that this is something. You, one of David's uh, most frequently used phrases is put pickles on hamburgers. Mm-hmm. That he, we hire people to put pickle on hamburgers, and you know this kind of speaks to time. Um, this actually, I'll give you an example of last year. Um, my wife was out um, on a girls' trip uh, and for three days, and you know I'm at home working. I said, you know what, the kids aren't here. She's out. I, I'm going to focus for three days and bust my butt, and I did. But she said, I only have one thing. Can you just clean the house while I'm gone? I hate cleaning the house. I really do. And it, it, that phrase put, you know, hire people to put pig on hamburgers really hit home to me because, you know, here, here we are having a business that every hour, every half hour, every five minutes, every 10 minutes counts. And if you break down how much we actually make per hour, I won't give the number out, but you know, it, it's far more efficient for us to be focused on our business and working in and out of our business as opposed to cleaning the house. So I said, you know what? She wanted the house clean, so I'm going to make sure the house is clean. So I get on care.com, and I pay 200 bucks for somebody to come in, do the dishes, fold the clothes, clean the entire house. It, it took one day, eight hours. I was working. We had probably made, you know, 10, 20 times that amount of money that day. But if I'd have taken time off of that day to clean the house, mm-hmm. we would have had that lost opportunity cost, where we would have had the opportunities to make the higher income. So, you know, something that I think folks should understand is you don't have to be all and do all. You know, if it's something, you know, emails, hire that out so that you can work on what you're really proficient at. Because if you're getting paid $200 an hour, don't do $10 an hour work. Let somebody else do that $10 an hour work. Guys, where can my listeners learn more about you, your company, uh, the courses that you teach, and also get a copy of the book that you guys have put out for uh, for folks? Uh, ReplaceYourMortgage.com. Uh, so if you go to the website, ReplaceYourMortgage.com, we've got tons of free information there. Also on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, Replace Your Mortgage uh, on YouTube. You're going to uh, see tons of videos there for free. Uh, also on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon, you can get our book. Uh, forget the price point, 14 or 15 bucks, I think it is. Um, Just type in Replace Your Mortgage on Amazon and get our free book. David and Michael, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. Uh, I had a blast connecting with you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining my guests, Michael Lush and David Dutton and myself on the Cashflow Ninja today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with your family, friends, and your network. Thank you so much for spending your most valuable asset with me, your time. And if there's any way that I can provide more value for you and serve you better at the Cashflow Ninja, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter or on our mailing list, you can sign up for our newsletter at cashflowninja.com or text Cashflow Ninja to 44222. Smart investors know that the banks actually don't own most automatic teller machines. In fact, the opportunity for private investment provides stellar passive returns, figures in the double digits, with the added bonus that most of the income is tax-free. 
Who wants to walk blindly past an ATM and not cash in on that opportunity? ATM machine ownership brings you a steady stream of hands-off passive income. Dave Zook and the Real Asset Investor team have been providing opportunities for investors in this uptrending activity of ATM use. If you're an accredited investor and would like more information on how you can invest in this exclusive asset class that very few investors will ever have access to, you can sign up for your free webinar on how to create income streams from ATMs at CashflowNinja.com forward slash real asset investor. Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott have been in your shoes and have used real estate investing to become financially free. They've designed a system to take any beginner to an experienced deal-making investor in the least amount of time. They offer opportunities from basic education, coaching, bridge loan investing to turnkey investments in the cash-flowing market of St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, please visit joinopsproperties.com or call Jimmy and Bob at 314-799-2247. The wealthiest investors on the planet know how to capture their wealth and leverage it to perpetually grow it. If you're interested in learning the premier strategies of the wealthiest individuals and families on the planet, you can access your free webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.